Hi, this is Zach from Morning Wound, and today I'll be taking a look at the Tudor Black Bay Chrono Steel and Gold. If Basel World 2018 was a year of great triumph for Tudor with the release of the Black Bay 58, then 2019 was a year of controversy with the release of the divisive P01. Regardless of where you stand on that watch, it stole the show. This was a bit of a shame because Tudor also released the watch I'll be talking about today, which was my personal favorite from their Basel World novelties, the Black Bay Chrono Steel and Gold. First released in 2017, the Black Bay Chrono is a bit of a contentious watch as well. Starting positive, it was the vehicle with which Tudor announced a very cool partnership with Breitling. In sort of a tech trade, Tudor would be getting a new and very cool chronograph caliber, the MT5813, based on Breitling's B01, but made to Tudor's specs. Breitling, in exchange, would get one of Tudor's three hand calibers tailored for them. Not your everyday movement, the MT5813 is a 41 joule integrated automatic column wheel chronograph featuring a vertical clutch, a silicon hairspring, a free sprung balance, a bi directionally winding rotor, and 70 hours of power reserve. It's also chronometer rated by the COSC. With specs like that, it's bound to make any chronograph fan, such as yours truly, very excited. The fact that it was available in a sub $5,000 watch made it all the more impressive. But the release wasn't met with fully open arms as the watch itself caused some concern. First, it's a chronograph in a line of dive watches that doesn't have a rotating bezel. Instead, it has a fixed tachometer bezel, which is more from the automotive and racing world. Second, the square region of the signature snowflake hour hand covers the subdials at certain times of the day. Us watch enthusiasts are a prickly bunch, and those issues, which are not without merit, overshadowed the cool caliber within. Fast forward to 2019 and Tudor announced the steel and gold model. Neither of those issues were addressed, which is frankly unsurprising, though the watch was refined, reducing the height a little bit. More importantly, they made it much sexier and more aggressive by playing with a two-tone palette and a healthy dose of black. An interesting aspect of Tudor's steel and gold watches is that they aren't PVD'd or plated. The components are either solid gold or a capped, which is like a thick gold wrap around steel. It's rare to find solid precious metals on watches in Tudor's price range. By mixing gold with steel, they're able to keep the price down, though these watches do come in at a premium above their steel siblings. On the chronograph, the bezel, pushers, and the center link of the bracelet's end link are solid gold, while the crown and remaining center links are capped. On a leather or fabric strap, the Blackley Chrono Steel and Gold is $5,600, which is almost a thousand more than the steel version, while on the bracelet, as seen in this review, it's $6,800. Whether the gold is worth it is really up to you and your budget, but it certainly pushes this watch further into traditional luxury territory. Intro over, let's get into the watch. If you've ever tried on the original Black Bay, the fit and feel of the chrono will be very familiar. The case shape and design is nearly identical, measuring 41 by 50 millimeters and 14.5 millimeters tall, including the crystal. This makes it properly a modern, medium-sized sport watch. While I've harped that I found the case too tall for the three-hand models, I think it works pretty well for the chrono which is actually a touch thinner than the manufactured black base, not including the 58. Automatic chronos are generally pretty thick, falling in the 14 to 16 millimeter range. The black base is actually on the thinner side of the spectrum, which offset my expectations. The sides are still slabs, which does exaggerate the height, but it's better balanced by the overall greater complexity of the dial and the pushers on the right side of the case. While on the topic, the pushers are massive, solid gold and screwed down. Both Tudor and Rolex have been using screw down pushers for years, and while there's a logic to them on a dive chrono to prevent accidental pushing, I find them cumbersome and generally annoying to use. Additionally, when unscrewed on the Black Bay, they leave a big gap between the pusher and the case, which just doesn't look right. With a rather large golden crown sitting between the two pushers, it feels like there is a bit too much gold on this side of the case as well. Steel or even black pushers with gold collars would have been a nice option. Off the bracelet, it's not as much of an issue, depending on your tastes. The bezel is also made of solid gold and features a black anodized aluminum insert with gold type. While there's a decent amount of gold here too, the combination of black balances out and looks very cool. There's a vintage John Player special vibe to it that really resonates and makes me wish I had a leather jacket and a muscle car at the ready. Is it weird that there's a fixed tachometer bezel? Absolutely, but it also looks great and as someone who doesn't dive, ultimately doesn't affect my usage of the watch. The dial of the Black Bay Chrono does a good job of introducing subdials to the Black Bay layout. All of the markers, especially the triangle at 12, are a bit smaller, giving the subdials at 3 and 9 more room to breathe. They really are the star of the show here. At 3, you'll find a 45 minute counter, while at 9, running seconds, both rendered in deep matte gold that just pops off the dial and beautifully ties in the gold of the bezel, crown, and pushers. The contrast subdials are also an improvement over the original solid black ones, as they use up the space better and give the dial an overall more balanced look. 
At six is a date window, which is a nice addition. I am particularly glad to see it's centered at six, which preserves the symmetry of the dial. That said, the black and white date itself is a bit underwhelming. Perhaps a warmer surface or more appealing bold type would have done the trick. Moving on to the hands, the hour and minute hands stay true to the Black Bay family. The minute hand is a straight sword that is a bit thinner here than on other models, while the hour is the signature snowflake hand. The Chrono Seconds hand is then a stick with a small red arrow tip. All three are in a pale gold tone. In the late 60s, when the Snowflake Hour Hand was originally designed, I don't think they ever intended it to be used on a chrono. While distinctive and appealing, it covers the dial, and between the hours of 2 and 4 make reading the 45 minute counter quite difficult, especially if the minute hand happens to be between 10 and 20. While the bezel I can explain it away with good looks, this I find to be a more annoying issue, and frankly a flaw. Ultimately, it's a personal call if it's something you can look past. The reality is, it doesn't affect the dial most of the time, but maybe that's rationalizing. On the wrist, the Black Bay Chrono wears really well. From above, it's bold, handsome, and with an undeniable machismo. From the side, yes, it's tall, but like I said before, within reason for a chronograph, and visually, the whole watch is more complex, balancing it out. Aesthetically, this watch just drips style and swagger. It looks amazing with jeans, leather, and dark colors, and is a compliment machine, if you're into that kind of thing. Personally, the bracelet adds too much gold, but on black or dark gray leather, it's just stunning. This is definitely a watch to wear if you want to impress people. To wrap up, wearing the Black Bay Chrono steel and gold for the last couple of weeks has been a real joy. It's an undeniably cool, masculine watch with style to spare that nails the two-tone aesthetic better than anything else I've tried. It's also expertly made with beautiful finishing, boasts actual solid gold, and features an incredibly cool movement at its heart. Of course, it does have the issues I mentioned with the bezel and hour hand. While I think I personally can get past them because aesthetically I find this watch so pleasing, I wouldn't blame anyone who can't, as both are annoying in their own way. And for a watch that costs $56 to $6,800 to have kind of obvious hangups is unfortunate. Personally, I'm most excited to see what Tudor is going to do with this new movement. Their Heritage Chrono line is in need of some love. They've also yet to bring back the big blocks, and they now have the perfect engine with which to do it. If you enjoyed this review, hit the thumbs up below and subscribe to our channel. Also be sure to check out the full written review on WarnAndWound.com. See you next time.